Uh, my name is Paul Marino. I have the honor to be uh, Dean of Faculty at Hillsdale College, and I'll be the MC of this uh, CCA Faculty Roundtable on uh, Ronald Reagan. I teach a course myself in uh, U.S. history since 1945, so it's very tempting for me to want to jump in and uh, give a, a talk myself, but I'll resist uh, that temptation and just introduce our speakers. I'll also resist the temptation to respond to what I thought was the most controversial uh, statement made during the conference, uh, Peter Robinson, when he uh, opened his talk with the uh, chant, Go Tigers. <laughs> Our first speaker will be Professor Alan Carlson. Alan Carlson is in his fourth year as a visiting professor of history here at Hillsdale. In addition, he serves as president of the Howard Center for Family, Religion, and Society and as international secretary of the World Congress of Families. He is the author of 12 books, including one to be released next month entitled Godly Seed, American Evangelicals Confront Birth Control, 1873 to 1989. Apropos of this conference, in 1988, President Reagan appointed him to the National Commission on Children, a post he held through 1993. Next will be Professor David Rainey, an associate professor of history here at Hillsdale College, where he's been teaching since the fall of 2005. Before joining Hillsdale's faculty, Dr. Rainey taught at Grand Valley State University, and prior to that at the University of Illinois, where he received his PhD in 2001. Dr. Rainey's fields in graduate school included early America, the United States since 1815, Britain since 1688, and American literature. Dr. Rainey received his AB from the University of Chicago in 1991, where he earned honors in history as well as college-wide honors. At Hillsdale, Dr. Rainey teaches courses that include the Western heritage and the American heritage, colonial America, the founding of the American Republic, Jacksonian America, and sectionalism in the Civil War. Dr. Rainey recently completed a three-year term as director of the college's honors program. In addition, Dr. Rainey is known for his publications, public lectures, and participation in academic conferences and panels. He is currently finishing a book about the United States Christian Commission in the American Civil War. Next will be Dr. Kevin Porteous, who did not provide a biographical sketch for me, <laughs> leaving it to me to tell the story of his life. A, a very risky uh, choice. Dr. Porteous is assistant professor in the department formerly known as political science. He has been with us since 2008. He earned his BA from Ashland University in 2001 and his MA and PhD from the University of Dallas. He has taught at Mountain View College and Belmont Abbey College and teaches in the graduate program in history and government at Ashland University. He can also tell you the representatives and demographic profile of every one of the 435 house districts, whether you want to know it or not. So welcome first, Dr. Carlson. Thank you. In the mid-1970s, when Ronald Reagan looked back on his period as governor of California, he resolved that he had made two major mistakes. Mistakes for which he tried to atone while serving as president. The first of these mistakes occurred on June 14, 1967, early in his first term, when he signed California's Therapeutic Abortion Act into law. This was six years before the U.S. Supreme Court's well-known Roe v. Wade decision, which made free access to abortion the law of the land. Prior to this new 1967 law, the state of California, like most states, had tightly restricted abortion to rare cases where, for example, a pregnant woman's life might actually be at risk. Reagan later admitted that this was, quote, a subject I'd never given much thought to. This comment rings true. For a clear national debate on the subject of abortion only began after Roe versus Wade was decided. Indeed, foes of abortion in the late 1960s were dispirited and disorganized. With this bill sitting on his desk, Reagan began a crash course of reading about abortion. According to one report, Reagan soon was quoting St. Thomas Aquinas. All the same, his staff convinced him that he should sign the measure. It had passed by veto-proof majorities in the California legislature, and Governor Reagan's aides argued that the bill's language, 
allowing abortion only in cases of rape or incest or where pregnancy would gravely impair the physical or mental health of the mother, these could be tightly interpreted through regulation. So, reluctantly, he signed. Alas, was, as with the other pre-Roe state-level laws liberalizing abortion in the late 1960s, patients and doctors alike quickly and greatly abused the mental health provision. The number of abortions in California soared. Reagan's, Reagan's second great self-acknowledged mistake came in 1969 when he signed into law a measure which introduced no-fault divorce to California. It was the first state to accept this recommendation from the American Law Institute, a prominent legal think tank. On the surface, no-fault advocates promised that the measure would reduce fraud and streamline the divorce process into a less bitter proceeding. Reagan most certainly was not aware at the time of the American Law Institute's deeper project, to sever completely private sexual morality from public policy, a goal to which no-fault divorce contributed. As one commentator has summarized, before no-fault divorce, a court discussed a divorce petition in moral terms. Who was at fault, say, in the case of adultery? To what extent? After no-fault divorce, such a petition would not be discussed in moral terms at all. Incompatibility was all that had to be claimed, and the number of divorces in California climbed sharply. During the 1970s, Ronald Reagan reversed his position on these questions. Regarding abortion, he became a vocal pro-life advocate even turning his wry sense of humor toward the pro-life cause. During his 1980 presidential campaign, for example, Reagan told the New York Times, I've noticed that everybody that is for abortion has already been born. One of his close aides, Bill Clark, would eventually compile a 45-page document of Reagan's quotes on abortion, all taken from his official presidential papers. Ronald Reagan even wrote a small book on the subject. Entitled, Abortion and the Conscience of the Nation, it was published by the Human Life Foundation in 1984, along with commentaries by Mother Teresa and the British writer Malcolm Muggeridge. Here are some passages from Reagan's piece. We cannot diminish the value of one category of human life, the unborn, without diminishing the value of all human life. The real question today is not when human life begins, but what is the value of human life? The real question for the abortionist and for all of us is whether the tiny human being has a God-given right to be protected by the law, the same right we have. We must all educate ourselves to the reality of the horrors taking place inside the abortion centers. Abraham Lincoln recognized that we could not survive as a free land when some men could decide that others were not fit to be free and should therefore be slaves. Likewise, we cannot survive as a free nation when some men decide that others are not fit to live and should be abandoned to abortion or infanticide. Well, these are strong statements coming from a sitting president. Indeed, according to the man who published the book, James McFadden, Reagan's essay had to be smuggled out of the White House by a pro-life secretary who had access to the Oval Office. Reagan's top aides, so the story goes, feared that publishing such ideas before the 1984 election would annoy pro-choice Republicans. Reagan didn't care. Let them be annoyed. Reagan also filled his administration with strong pro-life advocates. Edwin Meese as Attorney General, Margaret Heckler at Health and Human Services, and especially C. Everett Koop as Surgeon General. 
On matters such as marriage and divorce, Ronald Reagan became the first president since Theodore Roosevelt to openly and frequently comment on such family questions. Some examples. The family is the bedrock of our nation, but it is also the engine that gives our country life. It is the power of the family that holds the nation together, that gives America her conscience, and that serves as the cradle of our country's soul. From a talk to an Hispanic American group, the core of Hispanic culture is the casa, or the home, the almost mystical center of daily life where grandparents and parents and children and grandchildren all come together in the familia. And the family provides children with a haven of love and concern. For parents, it provides a sense of purpose and meaning in life. When the family is strong, the nation is strong. When the family is weak, the nation itself is weak. Ironically, the U.S. Department of Education became the center of family policy making during the Reagan presidency. Many conservatives had hoped that Reagan would abolish this department. Alas, just as with Halloween's Michael Myers, it's hard to kill a federal agency. It always springs back to life. Instead, Reagan put in place a solid team of pro-family people there. William Bennett as secretary, William Crystal as his chief of staff, and Gary Bauer as undersecretary of education. Among other projects, they produced a 1986 report, The Family, Preserving America's Future. This was the first attempt since the Theodore Roosevelt administration to craft a coherent Republican family policy. In 1987, Reagan issued Executive Order 12606. It required family impact statements on all proposed new federal regulations or policies, providing answers to questions such as, does this action by government strengthen or erode the stability of the family, and particularly the marital commitment? Does this action strengthen or erode the authority and rights of parents? And so on. Ten years later, I should note, President Clinton canceled this order. These then were some of the ways that President Reagan sought to atone for the mistakes he had made as governor of California during the turbulent late 1960s. In so doing, he became a sincere and forceful pro-life and pro-family president and so he should be remembered. Thank you. I won't even bother trying to adjust this microphone. It's a fool's errand. <clears throat> well, thank you all for joining us for our roundtable discussion this afternoon. Um, I, for one, have very much appreciated the many perspectives that our speakers have offered on President Ronald Reagan, and I trust that all of you have done so, uh, have done uh, the same. Well, as I reflected on the arguments that our speakers made over the last few days, uh, one assertion in particular uh, troubled me, and um, it got me to thinking a bit more about, um, about Reagan, and in particular about the question of uh, education, which I'll get to in a moment. The Honorable Senator Phil Graham, whom I admire greatly, by the way, just to make sure that that, um, uh, that position is clear, uh, Senator Graham posited that governments and institutions in general give people definition. As Senator Graham put it, governments and other institutions make people what they are. Americans, he claimed, are pretty ordinary people who have been made extraordinary by their form of government. Well, I have to take issue with that, at least to a certain degree, and I suspect Ronald Reagan would have done so as well. In his first inaugural address, Reagan reminded his fellow citizens that, quote, we are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth, 
unquote. He then went on to quote Dr. Joseph Warren, who was president of the Massachusetts Congress during our nation's struggle for independence. And Warren stated the following, quote, on you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important questions upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. In 1981, in Reagan's first inaugural address, he was calling upon his fellow citizens to act worthy of themselves by preserving the birthright of liberty for subsequent generations. Clearly, the government was not to define Americans. Rather, they were to define their government. The idea that people will define their governments and not the other way around has a long history in North America. In his ninth, I'm sorry, in his eight, third time's a charm. In his 1682 frame of government of Pennsylvania, I should know better, I teach this every semester, uh, every year. In his 1682 frame of government of Pennsylvania, William Penn opined that governments will reflect the attributes of the governed. Governments, Penn asserted, like clocks, go from the motion men give them. And as governments are made and moved by men, so by them they are ruined, too. Wherefore, governments rather depend upon men than men upon governments. Let men be good, and the government cannot be bad. If it be ill, they will cure it. But if men be bad, let the government be never so good. They will endeavor to warp and spoil it to their turn. <clears throat> well, Penn stated clearly his conviction that good government necessitated good people and that good people were made and not born. Wisdom and virtue were qualities that, according to Penn, quote, because they descend not with worldly inheritances, must be carefully propagated by a virtuous education of youth." End of quote. Reagan agreed wholeheartedly with this assessment. Quote, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction, the great communicator warned. And echoing Pericles during the Peloponnesian War, Reagan went on to say, quote, we didn't pass it, freedom, to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Like Penn, Reagan understood that education was not, to use a buzzword of the times, value neutral. Instead, education was a means by which the nation's youth could and should be trained in virtue. In his 1967 inaugural address as governor of California, which by the way coincided with uh, the serious campus disturbances of the late 1960s, which Dr. Carlson alluded to a moment ago, in this first inaugural address, Reagan called upon university professors as part of their instruction to quote, build character on accepted moral and ethical standards, unquote. I should say that Reagan uh, met with limited success on that front, particularly in dealing with uh, faculty at University of California at Berkeley, but uh, I'll leave it at that, leave it to your imaginations. Well, like George Washington before him, Reagan recognized an inextricable link between religion and liberty. Freedom prospers, Reagan said famously, when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. And Reagan stated flatly that, quote, without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. And this, of course, reminds me of uh, a document that uh, our freshmen read every year in the American heritage. Uh, and that, of course, is the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And I'd like to remind uh, all of you that the third article of the Northwest Ordinance, which was passed, of course, by the um, uh, Confederation Congress and then under the, uh, by the Congress under the Constitution of 1787, the Northwest Ordinance in its third article said the following, quote, religion 
morality and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Now, of course, we don't find anywhere in these remarks um, uh, an encouragement to establish a Department of Education, but clearly there is a... Um, there's an implication here that religion, morality, and knowledge were all necessary to good government. And Reagan understood all of this. That without uh, religion and morality, knowledge was meaningless. Good government could be, would be impossible. Well, Reagan understood well the interrelationships between education, virtue, and liberty. And perhaps the Gipper said it best, when he said the following. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today, and, and thank you to, I don't see Dr. Kaspar anywhere, but oh, maybe there he is. Ah, well, sir. Thank you for inviting uh, me, and Dr. Maino, thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. I want to make a couple of specific comments and, uh, then, and then move towards something that's somewhat more general. Uh, first thing I want to do is, is, just as Dr. Rainey picked at Senator Graham's remarks, I'd like to uh, go after uh, Professor Hayward's uh, comments in, in some greater detail. Uh, and Hayward made, uh, a, a, based a good deal of his argument on Reagan's self-education. And since we are here at an institution of higher learning, I would like to at least tentatively make the pitch for a, uh, uh, a formal education and therefore maybe justify my own existence to some extent. So, uh, look. Reagan, in large measure, did educate himself. I, I don't even begin to deny that. But, right, why did he self-educate? And I would suggest that in no small measure it was because the education he had didn't provide him with the training that he needed to deal with the situations in which he found himself beginning with uh, the Hollywood labor disputes in the 1940s. He self-educated out of necessity. Uh, moreover, uh, think about the circles in which he ran in 1940s and 1950s Hollywood. That is to say, there were a whole lot of people in 1940s and 1950s Hollywood who were left in a position for a variety of reasons where they had to, to one extent or another, self-educate. And many of them made disastrously bad choices or simply withdrew themselves from the struggle altogether. Right? That is to say, how many people started thinking about these issues and for a variety of reasons wound up as communists? Right? Now, this is not to suggest that self-education does not work. Right? We have examples, Reagan himself, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill. But I would suggest to you that those cases uh, are uh, at the very least, the exception rather than the rule. Right? Um, it took a particular combination of the right sort of character in the individual. These are all people that are, that are lauded in at least some circles at, at Hillsdale College as great statesmen. It took a certain kind, it took a certain predisposition both to learning and to good ideas right? that is not necessarily natural in the individual. Right? That is to say, we're not simply, well, I would argue that we're not simply born knowing what is just and what is unjust, and therefore to simply look at an idea and say, you know what, this is a problem, or yes, this is right. right? And a solid formal education can go a long way toward setting a person on the correct path. Right? And Hayward himself conceded that Reagan's formal education did play a role in his future beliefs. When uh, non-Keynesian economics became a viable alternative, Hayward asserted, and I think correctly, Reagan was amenable to it. It made sense to him because he had taken his degree in economics 
prior to Keynes' general theory of prior to the publication of Keynes' general theory of money and credit. Right? That is to say, his formal education predisposed him to see the wisdom in a particular course of action uh, when that particular course of action became viable later in his life. Okay. So much by way of, of education. A couple of specifics about Reagan's actions, uh, Reagan's political actions as president. One of the most notable uh, victories, and this is something that Senator Graham correctly pointed to uh, in, uh, in his remarks, was what, what he referred to as the Reagan recovery. And I would suggest to you that the Reagan recovery uh, began with Reagan's 1981 budget, which was, of course, one of the most titanic battles in modern political history, one to which Senator Graham alluded uh, specifically and, and at great length. Right? Uh, and, but to note not only right, the success, which he did, but also to respond to one of the criticisms of that budget and that policy, which is that Reagan's policies put us on the path of deficit spending, right? a path whose extreme fruits we are seeing before us right now. Right? So that is a primary accusation. Right? Uh, to the extent that, I wish I, I, wish I was as, as skilled with, with graphics as, say, Peter Robinson was, where I could just duck in and out and everything would be right there waiting for me. But that's, that's not who I am. So uh, there was an interesting chart put out showing growth in the federal deficit over terms in office. And it showed that all the explosions in growth took place right, during the, in, in modern history during the presidencies of Reagan and George W. Bush. Right? Uh, and not coincidentally, the bars on this little bar graph indicating that were bright red. Right? And that uh, compared to Reagan and George W. Bush, increases in deficit spending under Barack Obama were a pittance. Right? Uh, in terms of uh, adjusted, inflation adjusted numbers, per capita numbers, uh, and so on. Right? So in, in absolute terms. Right? Okay. Right? Uh, I would suggest to you, however, that if one takes a look back behind the simple numbers, right, one sees a, a, a more interesting pattern. That is to say that the real explosion in federal spending began before Reagan took office. Right? Now, the obvious target here is going to be Jimmy Carter, but I'm going to refrain from that. Right? Uh, not only is it low-hanging fruit, but I don't think it's correct. Right? The real explosion in federal spending begins with the passage of the 1974 Budget Act. Right? When you start looking at the increase in federal spending as a percentage, a percentage increase in federal spending year by year, right? in one of Hayward's books he chronicles that entitlement spending, which had been increasing at a relatively modest pace of something like 7 to 8% under Nixon prior to the Budget Act, began exploding not entitlement spending, but discretionary spending at a 26% rate. Right? That, discre that discretionary spending following the Budget Act. Right? Now, this was a period of mixed governance. That is to say, we had Republican presidents and we had Democratic presidents. Right? And the spending continued to increase. Well, what happened? Right? What happened was fairly simple. Congress reasserted control of the budget process over the president. Right? didn't take him out of the loop, but created a whole new congressional organization and reasserted congressional prerogative over the budget process in such a way as to really marginalize the president's ability to control federal spending. Right? Every year the budget comes out and somebody in Congress says that this budget is dead on arrival. Right? It's one of the rituals of Washington. Right? It happens all the time. Right? But the real explosion took place because th the power over discretionary spending or uh, decisive power over discretionary spending was placed in the hands of a group of people who have absolutely no incentive to control it. Right? And so whether the president was Republican or Democrat, his power to control the, the expansion of federal spending was minimal right? by the time Reagan took office. Okay. Uh, what else about that budget? Right? Uh, the Reagan recovery contained a number of elements. Budget cuts, tax cuts, regulatory restraint, sound monetary policy, right? the reigning in of inflation. Right? And many of these things, controversial or not, were enacted. Right? But one very important part of the Reagan program, right? 
saw more trouble than any other, right? And the instinctive thing is to say, well, the tax cuts. Yes, the tax cuts were very controversial, right? But what really got sacrificed to make all the rest of it work was spending cuts, right? In order to get enough support, right? Uh, well, first of all, the Democratic House didn't want to pass any of the spending cuts, but to, to get enough support, each congressman had to start, each congressman had to be essentially bought, right? I'll keep your program if you vote for the rest of the package, right? This was the price of getting the larger bill passed, right? And it was a very difficult thing on the part of the Reagan administration to prevent that from becoming a feeding frenzy. Okay, so that much by way of Reagan's recovery and budget program and deficits. Uh, next, uh, regulatory restraint. Right? Reagan was elected in part on a policy of regulatory restraint, reining in the administrative agencies, right? and bringing to heel the exploding modern administrative state. In this regard, he was not successful, but, but it was an instructive failure. That is to say, the growth of the regulatory state slowed under Reagan, but did not stop, and the acceleration resumed after his presidency. Okay. The instructive part of it is that what we have realized right, from the Reagan lesson is that it is not possible, right, it is not possible to bring to heel the modern regulatory state from the White House. Right? And it clarified something for us, right? a very a, a fairly, I think, simple concept. If you want to rein in the modern regulatory state, it must be done through Congress. Congress created it. Congress ultimately controls it. Only Congress can bring it to an end. Right? Not the courts. Right? The president we saw, congressional resistance, uh, overcame uh, presidential desire to control it. Uh, Congress, it may surprise you to believe, is perfectly capable of ignoring the Supreme Court when it chooses to do so. Let me give you one quick example. In 1983, Congress ruled, or the Supreme Court ruled something called the legislative veto unconstitutional. Right? The idea that Congress or committees of Congress or one house of Congress could void out an action by an administrative agency. Since that ruling in 1983, which I believe is utterly correct, Congress has included more than 500 legislative veto provisions in legislation, and none of them have been challenged. Okay, finally, Reagan and the Founders' Principles, and I hope I'm not going over time here. Right? Uh, Professor Hayward correctly said, in my opinion, that the central animating theme of Reagan's thought was that, the, that unlimited government destroys liberty in any form. Right? Unlimited government in any form destroys liberty. Right? Reagan's grounding for this understanding right, was, I think, in the principles of the American founding. And what Reagan realized was that that's the only sound basis for resisting the advance of the modern state. Right? It's the only principled basis for doing so. He refers, uh, uh, Peter Robinson referred to the speech, the 1964 Barry Goldwater speech, and you saw excerpts of that being played. Right? And never mind the lack of optimism in that speech. Right? The basic philosophy is there. He refers to the founding fathers repeated, repeatedly. He refers to their understanding of natural and unalienable rights explicitly as the alternative to rights as a dispensation of government. He refers to government by consent as the alternative to government by experts. And he makes it clear right, that government that sets out to do the things that the modern state does is tyrannical by definition. Right? It cannot help. Right? It cannot help but, but commit injustices and oppress its own citizens. That is to say, it's not bad because it's ineffective. It's not bad because it's incompetent. Right? Moreover, its injustice is not an incidental feature of the system. It is a necessary consequence of the existence of the system. Right? And by grounding his resistance to the modern state in the founders' principles and their constitutionalism, he made it politically acceptable to talk about those things again. Right? Which, for those of you who don't remember the time before the Reagan years, right, somebody asked a question about Reagan's Supreme Court justices. There really wasn't anybody else. Right? The pickings were so slim, right? because the idea that we should actually be faithful to their principles, their intentions, and the words of the founders was utterly laughable 
in political and legal circles. And Reagan made it possible to talk about those things again. And that might be his greatest accomplishment. Thank you very much. We can now uh, open the floor to questions for the panelists. Uh, we have the microphone bearers. If you would just signal to them to He was asking, did Ronald Reagan do everything he could do to stop abortion while president? And if not, what might he have done? Is that your question? I think he did a great deal. Uh, he, he, again, he, he placed a lot of good people in public office. Uh, we have to remember a president's constrained uh, multiple ways in terms of who's available, who's um, um, he's, he's got political debts to pay. He's got advisors who have their own lists of people they want to see in places. With that said, he did a very good job. I have um, some splendid people wound up working in government with some real effect. One, I'll just give you one example. Um, Carl, a, a, a friend of mine, Carl Anderson, became the chief counsel to the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the first term. Um, and kept the first Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, <laughs> moving in the right direction. He might not have moved in the right direction without Carl being there. He went on to be a White House aide, and today he's running these, he's the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus. Um, a fine guy. All through middle and senior level positions, Reagan made good appointments. Coop, as a Surgeon General, was, was brilliant. Uh, Coop was a strong foe of abortion. He'd co-authored books with Francis Schaeffer on abortion. Very controversial appointment, but he did things like that. Reagan endorsed um, major pro-life legislation in Congress, but remember he faced mostly a hostile Congress. These measures did not work their way through, but the Human Life Amendment he endorsed honestly and sincerely. Whenever he had a chance to say something in its favor, he did. Uh, no, so I think given the constraints that any president faces, um, I think he did, he did quite well as president. He faced a hostile Congress most of the time. Uh, he um, um, was, um, again, faced, the, I'll just I'll stress again, the constraints that any president faces. I mean, the fact that sometimes you have to, even as president, have to work around your own aides, and that, I, that's came up, come up several times in this, this, this week, uh, kind of suggests that this is not a, all-powerful person. It's someone who finds himself oftentimes in a very difficult and complicated political situation. But I would give Ronald Reagan uh, at least an A uh, for his efforts, okay? <laughs> yeah, Hillsdale stand. A Hillsdale A. I'm not entirely sure how I got appointed. I think it was because of that group at the Department of Education. I knew, I knew Bill Bennett somewhat. I knew William Crystal, Bill Crystal, and I knew Gary Bauer. And so I think that was, and I'd helped them on that one project I mentioned on that document. So I think that was why, how I got appointed. What it was was a unique event. Uh, Congress created the National Commission on Children to report on the status of the America's young. 
36 members, 12 appointed by the President, 12 by the Speaker of the House, and 12 by the President pro tem of the Senate. Well, the way that worked out in 1988 is that 24 Democrats, 12 Republicans. Um, so it was a monstrous task. Jay Rockefeller, Senator from um, West Virginia, was the chairman. Uh, the commission was really active 19, 1989 to 91. Through a miracle, uh, I can't, don't have the time to tell you all about it, but through a miracle, the final report of the Children's Commission was really quite good, um, called Beyond Rhetoric. And it came out in 1991. It's what the Democrats wanted was a re commission report which recommended increased funding for a variety of federal programs to support children. More money for Head Start, more money for daycare subsidies, more money for this, more money for that. But the final report came out as, and it was mainly because the conservatives on the panel, we did our homework and we worked hard. The liberals thought the staff would deliver what they wanted. Rockefeller turned to be a remarkably fair chairman. And um, the final report, which, was, which he browbeat his fellow Democrats into voting for it, um, much to their anger and disgust. Its principal recommendation was we needed to relieve uh, financial pressures on American families of taxation. So that was where the $1,000 per child tax credit idea first surfaced as a politically viable thing. And most of the other recommendations of the panel were quite good. Um, and indeed, most of them were actually eventually adopted, usually in a bipartisan manner. So it was, I was really proud of that commission, and um, I think it did good work. Got me $4,000 a year. That's <laughs> right. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the very last part of it. What role? Like, what factors do you think need to be in place in order for the education to be something that people can relate to? Yeah, I wonder if, I, I, my concern is that, and the reason I, the reason I tried to, to bring it up in this way was I don't know that there's any kind of institutional solution to the problem. In other words, um, the, uh, the difficulty lies in, in sort of the, 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 the fallen and incomplete nature of the human condition itself and your sort of just the, the odds of having the right kind of person. Just like you can't, um, you can't run somebody through a meat grinder institution and, and have a statesman at the end. It doesn't work that way. Right? Uh, it's contingent on factors which are inherent in the character of the individual person. Uh, now what those factors are, um, yeah, I could only uh, I could only guess about in a sort of preliminary way a certain predisposition towards certain conceptions of justice, but um, um, and so and so it's really uh, of, for me it ends up being a very hit or miss thing. I mean, I, my uh, I think my example is a valid one of Reagan's uh, co-workers in Hollywood and how many of them. Were, when left to analyze the issues for themselves, made devastatingly bad choices. Right? Uh, you see it sort of um, not in the same way, but uh, I see it in questions I get from people who are uh, active in the Tea Party movement. And that's not to say that, tea, that don't equate them with, with Artie Shaw and these guys, and that's not the point, right? Uh, and it's not... Um, um, it's not that, and it's not that they're not capable. It's that um, they've had a, a, a defective education. Many many people have. They know it, right? But they have no idea where to turn, right? And so they're just kind of grasping, right? And one of the nice, one of the one of the great things about being at Hillsdale is, is that you get to work with those people. And so when they, when they ask you a question, you can provide them with a reasonably uh, intelligent answer, right? Um, but s sometimes you look at the questions and say, you know, if it weren't for the right guidance, where would this person end up? The last question I got of this nature was, um, is the super committee unconstitutional? 
The super committee is the one that deals with, with the federal debt, right? Without going into it in too much detail, the short answer is no. Right? Uh, but, um, um, you know, in other words, that's actually not a bad case scenario. It's not a worst case scenario because the worst thing that happens there is you sort of get led down a constitutional interpretation blind alley, right? But if your choice is between communist and free, well, if you, make, if you go down the wrong path, it's more than a blind alley. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but that's, that's what I can say. Uh, Dr. Rainey, in your uh, talk, you gave the quote, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. And my question is, are we that last generation before the, the extinction? And if so, how do we make it so that doesn't happen? Well, I, I make no claim to being a clairvoyant. Um, I left my crystal ball back in the office. The closest thing is this bottled water, but I don't think that's going to work too well. Uh, your, your, your question is a fair one. Um, do I think we're that last uh, generation that Reagan talked about before the, the um, uh, uh, this, this um, loss of freedom? Um, I, would, I would like to say no. I, I hope that that's not the case. Uh, but I think it does speak to, Reagan was, was well aware of how fragile uh, liberty and freedom, in fact, uh, are. And that's why he and, and others have placed such premium on uh, this process of transmitting these, um, these virtues to uh, future generations. Because without good people, you can't have good government. And uh, that's something that certainly our founders acknowledged you know, for all of their wisdom in creating uh, a very um, uh, useful mechanical device of, of checks and balances and, of course, uh, separation of powers. Still, they acknowledged, they realized that uh, without uh, the people being good, without the people possessing virtue, uh, all of that was for naught. And uh, so certainly Reagan realized that, that, that freedom, that liberty is in fact fragile um, and uh, that it's, it's very easy to, uh, to lose it without um, making sure that, uh, that the young people of the nation uh, fully understand the nature of liberty, understand the uh, responsibilities that liberty carries with it. Uh, something, of course, that we say a great deal about here at Hillsdale. And uh, the, the question of responsibility um, it keeps, keeps coming up, and Reagan, Reagan knew that. He understood that, that freedom and liberty took sacrifice. He was, of course, willing to sacrifice on his, uh, on his part. Uh, and he expected his fellow Americans to do that as well. He, he routinely called them um, to uh, essentially rise to the occasion, and he was very inspirational to that effect, I think, in his first inaugural address. And, 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 uh, subsequent uh, oratorical performances. But um, I, I would say, just to, to, to sort of wrap things up, that, um, uh, that it's, in my view, it's not too late. I think that Hillsdale is part of uh, that effort to, um, uh, to get people to take virtue seriously and to understand that there is, in fact, a connection between uh, virtue and liberty, uh, and that without, uh, without virtue, without uh, a citizenry that possesses virtue, civic virtue, then um, uh, we're, we're ultimately lost. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, but certainly there are very troubling signs, particularly in the academy. Hillsdale, as you probably all know, is an exception to the rule. And we're talking about uh, the role of formal education. If you speak to some of your friends who maybe perhaps go to Big Ten schools or even the Ivy Leagues, uh, what are those students being taught about uh, virtue? What are they being taught about the prerequisites of good government. Uh, are they receiving an instruction uh, that does have a, a moral component to it that emphasizes, um, you know, emphasizes virtue? And I would argue in most cases, no. The education is, to use that buzzword again, it's, it's value neutral. Uh, there is no transmission of values, and if there is, uh, they're not very good values. They're not the values that, uh, that uh, we espouse and, and are certainly not conducive to good government. So, Yes, that makes me pessimistic, but, but obviously um, uh, all of you in this audience, I think, um, are part of this effort to reintroduce um, morality, uh, religion properly understood, and virtue into the educational process, and it must be there. It must be there. Without it, um, our system of government is, in fact, doomed. 
there any way I can stick my nose in that just a little bit? Uh, I, I, not, just, not to disagree with anything Dr. Rainey says uh, in any form, but we have a tendency, I think, in, in to be somewhat, uh, not just us, I say we in the, the, the broader sense, human beings, to be somewhat apocalyptic about our prospects. Um, and I would, I would suggest to you that uh, this, is not to, this is not to suggest that the, 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 the situation in which we find ourselves right now is, is sort of any, is any idyllic uh, conclusion to, to, the, to the struggle for liberty. But uh, imagine, if you were, uh, imagine if you were someone who, who held sort of Hillsdale-type principles in 1858. Right? This was not a good year for liberty. And I think it looked much worse then in the you know, Dred Scott decision, Kansas, Nebraska, and so on, than it does now. Or say in 1940. Right? 1940 was a really bad year for freedom. Right? At least it sure looked that way uh, with the fall of France and the Low Countries. And, and right, the, the, the world was basically dividing itself up into Nazi and communist. Right? And those were, many people were thinking that those were your choices which is rather amusing to think about in 2011, but right, serious people right, were, were thinking along those lines. So, so it's, it's, this is not to say that we have no problems, but to sort of be, have, put those problems in their proper perspective. Uh, this question is right to uh, Dr. Carlson. Um, I was wondering, as you were mentioning before, you made the quote that um, when the family is strong, the country is strong. And have you seen any resemblance in the past 20, 30 years or so where the family and the family core and its values have declined drastically and have led to where we are today? If, or is that not as big an issue as it may be? No, it's a very big issue, and probably on balance, things are getting worse, despite best efforts of a lot of people over the last several decades, including myself. Um, why, I, why that phrase is more than rhetoric, if families are strong, they don't need a whole lot of government to, to take care of them. Uh, they're able to take care of themselves. They're able to provide education for their children. They're able to protect their children. They can uh, take care of their, of their old people, their dependent, their sick. Um, when, um, when the family fails on all those tasks, somebody's got to do it. And voluntary organizations, if, if there's just too much of that burden there, are overwhelmed. Volu voluntary organizations become overwhelmed and they can't handle it. And the only recourse is government. Um, so that's why I think that there's truth in it. Are things getting, some things are getting much worse. Yeah, I'll choose one, one statistic, uh, births out of wedlock in the United States. Um, a tiny percentage in 1940. Um, the number began growing among African Americans in the 1950s, and it appears that misguided welfare policy was part of the cause of that. Um, the subsidies for um, unwed mothers were actually too high. Whatever the cause, that same practice spread among, started to spread among the white population in the 60s and 70s. By, uh, by the year 1995, about 36 percent, one out of, over one out of every three births was outside of, of marriage. Then it seemed to stabilize for about five, well, close to 10 years. That number just stopped growing. And it looked like, oh, we've done something right. Welfare reform in 1996 certainly reduced the incentives to have a child out of wedlock. But then, in the last three or four years, that number has started to climb again. It's now up to 40 percent, and it's climbing about one or two percent a year. Uh, pretty soon, we will be, um, um, uh, well, we'll be like the welfare states in Sweden, where the government is seen as the natural uh, support mechanism for children. So I'll, I'll, that's one, one could choose other examples of weakening. There are some things that are good that are happening. Um, if I was to point to the positive side, um, things like homeschooling, a revolution that nobody saw coming in, say, 1975. Uh, it's a revolution in education. Parents are reclaiming their right to educate their children in their own way. That's, now it's, uh, it's growing still, grow and, and that's, that's a very positive thing. Um, the effort to, um, um, you yeah, know, a growing number of family businesses, small family businesses, I think, again, is an extraordinary thing, trying to bring 
economic uh, activity back into the home, trying to, again, increase a sense of autonomy rather than reliance on big institutions in every place. So I can point to some very positive things happening. But overall, the uh, marriage statistics, uh, birth rate statistics, um, uh, divorce statistics uh, are not, in general, getting better, except in some communities. Thank you. Um, I'll let the four of you decide who will answer my question. Um, but I'm wondering how the debate over uh, Reagan's success and greatness as president has evolved um, over the past few decades, both among the public and in academics. Well, let me just make one, one uh, brief comment, and this might be in keeping with what Dr. Porteous said a moment ago, that we often have a tendency to romanticize or, or uh, to idealize the past, and I think that's certainly the case with certain aspects of, um, of Reagan's record. And the other night, there was a discussion about the uh, appointment of Justice Robert Bork, and uh, I would be one of the first and perhaps only uh, to argue that, uh, that the um, nomination of Bork was not an unalloyed good. Um, okay, good, I've got support, thank you. Brother. Um, and I, I do remember the, um, the battles over his nomination. And uh, at one point, of course, Bork was soliciting uh, assistance from a number of organizations to help lobby Congress on behalf of his nomination. And one of the organizations he approached was the National Rifle Association. And I can recall talking to Bork about this after the fact. Of course, he's quite disgruntled. And at the time, I was actually working at the NRA. And uh, he got this very sour look on his face and said, well, you guys just didn't help me out. And I said, well, sir, I said, you've gone on record as basically saying you do not believe that the Second Amendment, um, in effect, uh, preserves, protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Instead, you adopt a, uh, a collective rights interpretation. Well, yeah, I kind of hemmed and hawed. But he said, well, I, I did rule for the NRA in a different case involving uh, uh, possessions of firearms in the district. But I think uh, things like that often go overlooked. And again, um, uh, had Bork been added to the court, I have no doubt that he would have provided quite valuable contributions in many respects uh, to our jurisprudence. However, uh, in one key case, which was decided in 2008, uh, he may very well have gone a different direction and we wouldn't have um, the Heller decision which we have today. So uh, I think, again, time has a tendency to, um, uh, to obscure certain facts. People tend to romanticize the past, uh, and uh, that is often problematic, and I'm just providing one example of that. If you're asking how, we, how historians and commentators are measuring the Reagan presidency today, compared to, say, thir three, um, when, he, when he left the presidency, it seems as though his reputation is growing. I mean, that's my impression, mm -hmm. judging from even the standard lists in places like the New York Times. He's seen as a strong, effective president, and I think you know, certainly one of his legacies was the, um, you know, he, he faced down the Soviet Union. And uh, I mean, one, again, an amazing, amazing uh, victory that in 1980 would never have been predicted. Now, there were other factors and other causes, but I think if he had, he was a necessary actor in that. If he had not been there, I think something else probably would have happened. I don't know what. It would have been worse. But I think generally his, his reputation seems to be growing right now. Um, certainly the, the centenary of his birth has brought forth many tributes. Even Barack Obama tries to quote him whenever he can, so uh, to, to try to let some of the magic rub off. Um, I would, I would also note, though, picking, picking up right where you left off, that I think you're going to see progressives, liberals, and you've seen, you saw some of it around the time of his birthday, attempt essentially the same body snatching expedition which they did with Abraham Lincoln. That is to say, they have, there's this guy who's unabashedly popular, so let's appropriate him and wash over all the things we disagree with and try and reinterpret him, in Lincoln's case, as a proto-progressive. And in Reagan's case, as one of the things that Obama likes to do is say, Reagan would have done this, all right? Uh, and, and so that's just one example, but an attempt to reinterpret um, uh, 
a, a attempt to reinterpret Reagan as, as a sort of crypto liberal whom we, whom, who, who's really progressive if you really get past all the things he said and did. I mean, he's, really, he's really one of us. So I would, I would uh, it's, 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 worth, uh, uh, it's worth watching, I think. Yeah, I think I, I think you could see that when Reagan. Uh, <coughs> Guess who's uh, here? <laughs> I'm awake now, Paul. Thanks. <laughs> uh, when Reagan died, I, mean, I remember watching some of the uh, you know uh, commemorations, and I said, I can't believe this was the same guy, you know, the same networks treating him the way they did in the, uh, the 1980s. And one of our speakers noted that liberals are starting to come around to give Reagan his his due, that the sort of the hidden hand. Uh, rehabilitation of Eisenhower was going on with Reagan. I think that's the case. Reagan's stock is rising with liberals, and it's starting to fall with conservatives. You're seeing more and more conservatives who are critical of, uh, of Reagan. Uh, Professor Gamble uh, isn't here, but um, he's, he's written some very interesting pieces about Reagan really sort of disputing that he was a conservative uh, at all. So that may be something to look for in Reagan's uh, a reputational future. Uh, I'm sorry, but we are just about out of time. It's 5 o'clock, so uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for the... Yeah. Yeah.